Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Lord, thank you for every single thing you do. Lord, thank you most of all for the salvation you've given in, in Christ for those who, who believe in him, Lord, who accept him in heart, heartfelt faith. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open hearts and minds today to your word, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts. We ask that you would take this offering and use it to further your will. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Yes. <coughs>
Some thought I was a goner, I think. <laughs> I was, uh, but I saw my doctor Friday. And I told him what had took place, what had taken place. And I said to him, I said, uh, um, I said, I didn't sleep from three on. And I didn't sleep much till then. And then I came to church and was preaching when I got, and when I quit last Sunday, I was not quitting because I couldn't go no further. I was quitting because I was done. But I sure glad it was over with when I, when that came on. I'd hate for it to mess up. But I sat down over there and my chest was like it's going to blow out of my, I mean, it felt like it's going to explode. And uh, when I sat down over there and it just, I don't know what I said to the Lord or whatever, it wasn't two minutes it was over with. So, and I could preach last Sunday night. I mean, if you call it preaching what I do, but anyhow. <laughs> Uh, the Lord enabled me to do it. I'm grateful for that. Uh, he told me if it had been a heart attack, it would not have been just two minutes long. I said, well, amen. Uh, I want to speak to you this morning. God put this on my heart, and I trust He'll speak to our hearts today. Uh, if you'll turn to the book of Ezra, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, go to es uh, go to uh, Ezra. And you'll uh, it's right on the other end of first, Second Chronicles. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I was reminded of something. Can you hear me? Huh? Okay. You probably couldn't hear me. You could hear me at, without that. But I think it sounds better when when it uh, uh, when I can hear it. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what that meant. <laughs> I don't know what that meant. Ezra chapter 1 verse, verses 1 through 6 and then I'm going to talk about the subject of spiritual awakening. <clears throat> spiritual awakening. I want to hurry and get to the point I'm going to insult you by reading something to you today. But I'm going to tell you, I read it again yesterday. I've read it several times in the years gone by, and it just made me weep. So <clears throat> I trust it will do the same thing for you. Our hearts need to uh, be turned toward the Lord in a way unlike ever before. Uh, notice, if you will, the Bible says in the first chapter of the book of Ezra, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdoms and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house and house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people. His God be with him, and let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God. I like that word. He is the God. He's it. Nobody else. Everything else is called God is a, is a figment of somebody's imagination. Yeah, it's breathed by Satan. That, and that it's, it's given by Satan, that uh, imagination, whatever it is that called on people to turn from God to something else. But he goes on to say, He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever run, remaineth in any place where he served, sojourneth, let us let the men of his place help him with silver and gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that, that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with those whose spirit God raised. Now I want you to see something. That's my first point when I get to it. And they, all they who were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, uh, with goods, with wild beasts, with precious things, 
beside all that was willingly offered. I want us to see this morning, and I don't think I need to tell you this, but I'm just saying it anyhow. These are dark days in America. As a matter of fact, I believe we're in, in, in as bad a shape in, as a country. I don't think the Civil War was much worse than what it is now. We are that divided. We are that, we are that parted. We are that, uh, I, I, we're 50%, 50%, that's where it is. It's a sad state of affairs, beloved. Our culture has no sense of answering to God. As a matter of fact, uh, old Arnold Toynbee, if I remember correctly, he was a Frenchman, came here to America, and after he had been here, he said, America is great because America is good. But when America ceases to be good, America will no longer be great. Now, I got this tie on this morning. I didn't choose it because I was preaching on that, but I want to tell you today, I'm not a bit ashamed of being a citizen of America. Amen. I'm glad to God I'm privileged to be brought into life here and spend my life here. And I think it's the most God-blessed nation of the world and has been used of God to bless the world. But in the latter part of the last century and the start of this one, uh, we haven't been much in the way of worshiping God. Our culture, our culture uh, is, a, is a culture of moral, of losing its moral bearings. Our culture is one that's ruled by the enemy of God, people, the vast majority of people. Let me make a statement that I believe is true. I'm convinced that the majority is never right with God. You look at it in the Bible. The majority of people in a situation are never right with God. It's always the minority. Don't be surprised. God's people have always been the minority. They've always been on the wrong end of the of the bullet or whatever. Uh, they are hated today. More Christians are being killed today than in, in, in a long time. And the reason is that uh, there is a hostility toward God and a hatred of Jesus Christ and the Word of God and people want no part of it. That's the truth in America, folks. You watch it. You just watch it. If you live long enough, I, I just soon go on to glory today. I hate it for my kids. And by the way, somebody said, how'd your daughter do? You ought to see the before and after x-rays of her spine. I mean to tell you it's something else. God saw her through it, and I think she went home yesterday. I haven't talked to my boy. But it was, it was four, four hours long. But uh, uh, she did well. She's had a, pain, a lot of pain, uh, of course, up until now, and, and uh, she will have more pain. That's a serious surgery when they cut on you for uh, four hours. That probably wasn't four hours long, but it ended up getting her ready and then getting her closed up and everything. And, uh, but we're, we're grateful to God and praise His blessed name and pray that she'll be to the praise of His glorious grace in her days while, she, while they remain on earth. Now, we were talking about, uh, uh, about the situation in our nation. Uh, Self-will drives us, and money has become the bottom line of, in everything. The, now listen to this. The question nowadays is not is something wrong, right or wrong, but is it, is it po politically correct? And will it be acceptable to the innumerable bunch, bunches of, that's, that's not a good word to describe it, groups is a better word, of special interest groups that, uh, that exist today. The future of Israel looked black in that day, just like the future of, of America looks black today. Uh, the majority of the nation of Israel in that day 
were backslidden, apathetic, and apostate. Uh, I have, uh, I know, but, well, I'll just share it with you uh, in a minute. The judgment of God because of this, their hankering for idolatry. The judgment of God had sent them to the heart and homeland of idolatry, which was Babylon. For 70 years they were there because of their rejection of God. I read scripture, I read scriptures, I thought about this and verse after verse and my heart broke. Let me just read something to you. you uh, right across the page from where I read, if you'll notice down there at the bottom, I was reminded yesterday as I looked at this, this is, that it's almost identical, uh, identical to the first two verses in the book of Ezra. But it's the Holy Spirit who's the author of the book. And I don't know why he chose to do that, but he did. And then he comes right back and puts it in the next, in the next book. But listen to this. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. That's chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles right across the page from Ezra 1. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled, listen, humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of God. Speaking, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, he was the mouthpiece for God. The Spirit was giving him what God wanted him to say. And he was saying it, and this man didn't pay any attention to it. He, he did not respect... He did not respect the, the man of God. He did not bow himself, humble himself before the prophet. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who, had, who made him swear by God. Listen to this. Who made him swear by God that he, uh, but he, stiff neck, he has stiffened his neck, hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief, this is verse 14, all the chief, priest and the people transgressed very much after uh, all the abominations of the nations and polluted the house of God which he had hallowed in Jerusalem and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up early and sending because he had compassion on his people. God, listen, I'm so glad today. One of the things I thank God for is his long suffering. I am so glad today God puts up with me. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. I'm so glad God has put up with me. Because you see, if God wasn't long suffering, there wouldn't be a human being on the face of the earth today. The Bible, the Bible says, but they mocked the messengers of God. No, I mean, he had, he had uh, compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. Now notice the next five words. Till there was no remedy. Do you see that? Chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles, the 16th verse, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden old man or him who stooped for age. He gave all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of the princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious vessels. And those who, escaped, who had escaped from the sword were carried away to Babylon. And, and where, let me see, where there, they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths 
For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Can you get just a glimpse of what the situation was in, in that, amongst that people now? Can you imagine, can you imagine God just walked off and left them? And that's, he's, we're not above that in this country, folks. We're not above that in this country. I want to hurry up because I want to read you something that's precious. I want you to notice that the future of, this, of Israel looked bleak as it does, as does ours today. The majority of the nation is backslidden. The majority of our nation is apath apathetic. Uh, the majority of our, nation, of our nation is apostate. I read a illustration about uh, let me go on and say a few more things the judgment of God because of this hankering for idol idol idolatry had sent them to the hard homeland I said that already instead of sp seeking God in repentance after being re uprooted from the land the Israelites allowed listen they allowed the pagan culture of their new environment to neutralize and paganize them. Uh, the majority of the opinion was who's God and who cares. The majority of the opinion, I'm afraid it's in the church, is Inside, in spite of the fact God preserved a remnant who experienced revival that remnant listen never forget God always has a remnant you remember when I was preaching about uh, about uh, uh, Mary uh, 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 not Mary but I was preaching about Elizabeth and her husband at the birth of John and how I talked about there were God's remnant was there in that picture four people in, in, in is, a, is pointed out there four people are pointed out there and those four people were uh, uh, were husband and, and Elizabeth and, uh, and then there was uh, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus and, and her husband and then there were two old, senior old saints in Acts chapter, uh, not Acts chapter 2, hold on just a minute, uh, in, uh, in Matthew, I think it is, hold on just a second, two, two old saints of God waiting for the arrival of the Lamb of God. Uh, and uh, Joseph and Mary, uh, uh, when they took the baby in to be, uh, to be circumcised uh, it, the, the Bible says no, I'm not telling you right uh, it may be Luke but you know what I'm talking about the old the old, uh, old lady and the old man there uh, a widow and a senior 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 man uh, and the Bible tells us uh, that uh, well I'll say to my time I can't see what I'm looking at well, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, here it is. Thank you, Lord. It's uh, Simeon. The Bible talks about Simeon in Luke chapter uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1 and... No, chapter 2 and verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. God's always had His people. They are in a minority. But if that people have God at heart, if they are serving God, if they are exalting God, if you see what they are returning to here is a restoration of the worship of the true God alone. And as a result, things begin to change. In spite of that remnant that God had... Uh, uh, had preserved uh, who experienced revival 
who were willing to risk all in returning to the place of God's choosing and there to experience the reviving of God's people in, in proper worship of Jehovah God. You, does that make any sense? Am I, what I'm saying make any sense? There must be a return to God. None of us are as right with God as we ought to be. The, the finest Christian you ever know uh, is never at the place while he's, he or she is on this earth that they don't need to go on with God. You can never get up too close to God. You can never. You must be moving. We need to be moving. It's a matter of fact. I don't mean moving housewise. I mean moving in our spirit in a close follow of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what... Uh, you know what a disciple is? It's a life a, a lifelong serve a, a lifelong learner and follower of Jesus Christ. That's the uh, that is the idea in the definition of the term disciple. A lifelong learner and follower of Jesus Christ. Are we disciples of Jesus Christ? If we've been born again, we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be those whose lives are wrapped up in Him and not ourselves. Now I'm going to tell you, uh, if you're looking for a perfect preacher, you keep on looking because I'm not one of them. But neither are you perfect Christian either. Nobody is. What I'm trying to say is every one of us are totally dependent upon God for everything. Never had a bout of food put in my mouth but what God didn't supply it. I have the health I have, the good measure of health that I'm privileged to have at this point, at this stage in life today is a gift from God. The house that we own is a gift from God. I'm telling you today, beloved, that family that God has given us, all four of them young ones, and what grandkids we have, and a great and a granddaughter-in-law. God's gifted us. God's gifted us. And he's gifted us in a, in a literal way individually and as a family and as people of God, we're gifted. Oh, how gifted we are. I'm not talking about natural, uh, natural talents. That's a gift of God too. Uh, I, I, talk about, <laughs> I talk about Margie's singing, but I want to tell you she blesses my heart when she sings. I, I kept having my ear go like this today so I could hear her. I, I can sing better when I can hear her. I don't sing so loud, but I can sing better. But anyhow, uh, I just want us to see how dependent upon God we are and how, how, how what's the word I'm trying to use to describe it, how little is our dependence upon Him. We depend upon Him for everything, but we don't look to Him with the understanding of where that blessing comes from. Am I making any sense? Nod your head if you think I am. All right. I'm simply trying to say, talking for myself and to you, that we need to be more consciously aware of the right of God to command our lives to have His way. Uh, we need to be more aware of the fact that this book is to be the absolute and final uh, uh, final authority for all matters of all matters of faith and and uh, practice. Nothing but the book. When you get rid of the book, you ha don't have anything. When you say I don't need that book, how you say that? Not ever reading it. Not ever reading it. I tell you. I, what I said to you about this, these two verses being, reminding me this morning, I had forgotten that those two verses in the 26th verse, in the 26th chapter, 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles were almost identical to the first two verses of Ezra. I was reminded of that. I had forgotten that I had forgotten them. <laughs> but anyhow, I, I'm just saying... This book, if we're going to see revival, we're going to have to get back to this book. We're going to have to worship God in spirit and in truth. I tell you, only the Spirit of God can give us worship. 
Only the Spirit of God. Uh, I was raised in a church in which the Spirit of God, I may have said this the other day, but I want to say it again. I, w I was raised in a little Baptist church and they didn't know nothing about the Spirit of God. Nothing, no real issue was made about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you today, I have come to see that if the Spirit of God is not acting active in it, you might as well go home. And, and whoever's preaching to you might as well too. <clears throat> the Spirit of God initiates the work. And, and verse 1 it says, says that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the heart, stirred up the spirit. The NIV translates that the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus. I like that. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus. Here's an old pagan king and God moved him to do what God wanted done. God can use pagans to get His will done, folks. God can use uh, vile, filthy sinners like all wretches, all of us wretches. And that's the truth about us. I think we got a high, uh, too high opinion of ourselves. Were it not for grace. You know that song? Were it not for grace. Why would God pay attention to the likes of me and you? Why? Not because we're worthwhile to Him. It's because He cares about us. Enough to give His only begotten Son, His unique Son, that by the grace of God, through faith, I got the gift of eternal life. So did you, if you're born again. So we see that the Spirit of God initiates the work. A minority of people are willing to break with the lifestyle of, comp of compromise and accommodation in order to return to a biblical way of thinking and living. If you r read in the book of, uh, well, it's chapter 3, uh, there, uh, there it's listed here uh, that the, the Bible says, and when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. And then stood up, the, uh, it's Joshua, it's Yeshua. And by the way, that means he is saved. That name means he is saved, the way that name comes out. But J Joshua means, uh, 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 Joshua is the uh, Old Testament uh, name for Jesus in the New but, uh, but the Bible says Jehoshaphat Jehoza, uh, uh, was the father of Yeshua and his brethren the priest and Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and his brethren and builded the altar of, God, of the God of Israel to offer burnt, offer, offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon its bases for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings unto it, on, on it unto the Lord, even burnt offerings and morning and even. And they, f and they kept the feast of the tabernacles that is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. You know what they did? They went back to Jerusalem. They went back to Jerusalem. And when they had moved back there, what they did was they simply began to worship like God had, had instructed them to worship. That was put me first. Jesus said that, that uh, 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 it is said by Paul that in all things he might have the preeminence. That means to be first. And I'm not standing up here telling you I'm all that hot spiritually. I don't mean that. I wish I was. But I'm not. I want to be and uh, I trust God will give me grace to be more like Him the, the days I have to live on this earth. 
Now let me just say another thing or two and I'm going to quit and read you this. I don't want to run out of time. My soul, it's already out of time. Let me read this. I can't keep on that, God. Will you listen carefully? This is one, I mentioned this the other, Sunday before last, I think. The 1850s found America in a sad and sickened state. There was great luxury on the part of few and great poverty on the part of many. Crimes rate, crime rates soared, violence was common, city streets were unsafe, free love was espoused, espoused, and the home seemed to be on the verge of collapse. Economic instability haunted the nation. The un in unemployment raged out of control and corruption and injustice shamelessly walked hand in hand in high places. Racial division, the slavery question, the slavery question separated family and friends. Many wondered if the land of the free and the home of the brave was not writing the last chapter in, of its history. That's 150 years ago, folks longer than that and the Bible says in 1857 perhaps given urgency by the national crisis severe national crisis which touched every area of life God's people began to become serious about prayer for revival the revi this revival is often re referred to as the prayer revival there was first a revival of prayer, not casual, uh, passive prayer, but vital, importunate prayer. In answer to the church's desperate cry, sending from all parts of the land, the Spirit of God in a quiet way at, a, at first, then suddenly throughout the length and breadth of the land renewed the church's life and wakened the, in the community around it the deep thirst for God. Many meetings are worthy of note. One is the prayer meeting. I meant, This is what I mentioned to you, which later became famous under the name the Fulton Street Prayer Meeting. Jer Jeremiah Lamphere was a preacher in New York. He had a tremendous burden for revival. He called on a few Christians to meet with him at a location on Fulton Street for a prayer meeting on behalf, in behalf of revival. He arrived at the appointed place on September the 23rd, 1857. He was later joined by five others. The, this inauspicious meeting was the beginning of a mighty prayer meeting from which dozens like it were launched across the country. Soon businessmen were closing their businesses and meeting in prayer meeting to be meetings to beseech God in behalf of their beloved country. The prayer meetings were simply that no more. Requests were read and prevailing prayer followed. Many were converted in these prayer meetings themselves. Throughout the land, defined fire broke out, and white-haired old, old penitents knelt with little children to receive Jesus Christ. Whole families of Jews were converted to their to their, their true Messiah. Deaf mutes were reached with glad tidings of salvation, and though their tongues were still, they couldn't talk. Their faces shone with the brightness that they had without words become effective messengers of the gospel. The most hardened infidels were, made, were melted, some being led uh, by Christ to, uh, to Christ by the testimonies of little children. Some of the most amazing aspects of this revival are recorded in only a few little known accounts. The Spirit of God literally moved upon the face of the waters a multitude of, of, of seamen were saved while yet at sea. Ships as they drew near to land seemed to come, under, uh, come within the zone of the heavenly influence. Vessel after vessel arrived at land with the same tale of a mysterious conv conviction breaking out 
among the crewmen followed by dramatic conversions to Christ. One, on one such vessel, a captain and an entire crew of 30 men found Christ at sea and entered the harbor with rejoicing. Perhaps the most striking awakening took place on a battleship. The North Carolina was a battleship. It lay an anchor in New York Harbor. Her complement was about a thousand men. On board there were four men who discovered their spiritual kinship and agreed to meet together for prayer. They were given permission to use a remote part of the ship far below the water line for their meeting. They re represented three denominations. One was a Presbyterian, one was an e Episcopalian, and two were Baptists. One evening as they met in prayer the light of a in the light of a tiny lamp, the Spirit of God suddenly so filled their hearts that they brushed out forth in joyous song. The sweet strain uh, of their song rose to the deck above. Mary making sailors were astonished and came running down. They came to mock, but the mighty power of God had been liberated. <clears throat> by rejoicing faith. The power gripped them with such force that their laughs of ridicule were changed to cries of repentance and they were smitten on the spot. Thus a great work began deep within that ship. Night after night as prayer meetings were held, sailor, sailors were being converted. They were forced to send to shore to get help for, for, uh, to get help uh, uh, in counseling those who were coming to faith in Christ. The old battleship soon became a veritable house of God, a floating spiritual battle station, spreading the met witness of the awakening everywhere. It's estimated, listen, it's estimated that during the months of the revival, of the revival's greatest intensity, no less than 50,000 persons a week were swept into the kingdom of God. Amen. 50,000 people. Conservative <clears throat> estimate claims that more than a million people met Jesus Christ as Savior in a 12-month span of time. And down at the bottom it says, Lord, do it again. Amen. Do it again. I want to ask you this morning. I'm not looking for a I'm not looking for a hand up or anything. I'm just asking us, will we become those to whom people are drawn because the Spirit of God is moving in us? Can I challenge you this morning? Go to your home. Uh, sort you out a place of your own or a place for you and your mate and just get in this book and get on your face and pray. You say, preacher, I can't get up and down. Well, set in a recliner, that's fine. It's not the posture of your body, it's the posture of your heart. Amen. I don't know any more to say. But God help us to become what we ought to be so we can be before others what they need to see. Bless you, folks. Ask you to stand if you're able.
any prayer requests before we I close this in prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. We ask that you revitalize us, revive us. Um, be with our country, Lord. Be with this church, our community. Be with our families, our friends, our enemies. No. Lord, just ask that you continue to bless us, continue to work with us, uh, continue to show grace to us as we go about our daily lives. Just asking that you don't give up on us and help us to not give up on you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.